not very well. Okay. Uh, we're moving on to something called titrations. And uh, titrations are um, titrations are a uh, like a very specific type of quantitative chemical analysis. So what we're going to be using when we do titrations is uh, typically it's an acid and a base, but it doesn't have to be an acid and a base. It could be we could do precipitation titrations. We could do something called redox. Sorry, redox titrations. We can do lots of different stuff. Um, a titration is going to be using this piece of glassware. This piece of glassware is, is basically the most expensive piece of glassware that, that we, we allow students to use. How much is it? Um, the, so this is, it's actually two pieces of glassware that are connected at the bottom. And so the top part is called a burette. And then the bottom part is called, you can call it a valve if you want, or the proper name, the historical name, is a stopcock. Okay? Um, yeah. <laughs> so, so this is a this is a burette, okay? It's a long, skinny glass tube, and it's got graduations the exact same way that a graduated cylinder would have them. This is one of our most precise volume measuring tools. It costs, this thing alone costs about $60. So it's not bad. Yeah, it's not thousands of dollars, right? What? Uh, pi a pipette is quite expensive, but a pipette is about, no, a pipette is like 30 bucks or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> sixty. I don't know. Six. I feel like sixty dollars is a lot of money. I don't have sixty dollars to to blow right now. So yeah, when. <laughs> yeah. When the stock cost, uh, costs about. Um, I no. I can't remember actually, and I'm gonna have to look it up because I don't want to lie to you. Is that okay? I don't want to lie to your face, so I don't. I don't, I don't want to. I want to guesstimate it at about fifteen dollars, but I, I really don't know. Um, the stopcock, the, the valve, all it is is it's exactly like the faucet. It's exactly like a faucet, um, uh, like handle or something like that. And so, uh, what I want to be very clear about straight from the get-go is there's a little handle here on the stopcock, and I don't know if you can see, but it's. It's horizontal right now, so it's it's not parallel to the flow of the liquid. Does this mean open or closed? That means closed. And if I if I uh, turn it parallel, then that means open. And then any liquid that's in here can start flowing through our stopcock into our sample or something like that. Okay. So okay, perfect. Um, so let's just talk a little bit about titrations, and I'm gonna I'm gonna try and show you in general, in general what a titration looks like, and then um, uh, and then we'll we'll move on from there and do some math and stuff like that. What is a titration? A titration is used to determine the concentration of a solution. That's really the only thing. That's the only thing we really care about. It's used to determine the concentration of one solution. Now, a solution or a titrant is carefully added to a specific volume of a sample until the reaction is judged to be complete. Now, that's a, that's a weird phrase because that, that judge to be complete is a little bit, it's a little subjective. Do you know what the term subjective means? It's, it means influenced by opinion or perspective or feelings. Objective means truth. There's one answer. Yes, that's the thing that it is. But subjective means that mm, could be this, could be that. Yeah. Why is it called a titrant? What, what, what? A titrant, because the, the process of doing this analysis is called a titration, 
And, and the, the thing you add during a titration is called a titrate. They just decided, they just, they just said, oh, that's an awesome word. Yes, I love that word. Let's, let's use that word. I don't know what, I don't know what, I don't know what to tell you. Okay. Um, the reason why it's a little subjective, the reason why it's a little bit subjective, as you'll see here in a little bit, is that there's going to be a color change. And it's the color change aspect of this titration that becomes a little bit subjective. Okay? Now, at some point, the reaction will finish. And what I mean by that is, is that let's, uh, let's think about a chemical reaction, a really, really basic chemical reaction. A plus B gives you C. Fantastic. Now what I want to what I want to ask you is is a lot like limiting in excess reagents. Okay, let's say in a beaker I had five moles of A. I want you to predict for me. Shh, I want you to predict for me how much B do we need to completely react with five moles of A? Five. Five moles. Right? Is that complicated math? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe it was. It's a one-to-one -one ratio, right? So we require five moles, okay? So what's going to happen is, is you're going to have a little bit of liquid in here. By the way, I want to be very clear. I should be using an Erlenmeyer flask. What's the difference between a beaker and an Erlenmeyer flask? Mm -hmm. One's bigger. One's no, not, not one's bigger. What was that, Stephanie? I don't think I said it right. Oh, okay. Sorry. I'm going to go no, get another like class. Just so that we're all good. That's not right. Precision. Precision. There we are. Precise. Precise. I said one. I really cannot think of it. I'm pretty darn sure that I did this for my grade 10 students last year. Hello. I'm pretty darn sure that I did this for my uh, grade 10 students last year. But I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page. Okay, here's the beaker. What shape do the walls of the beaker make? I don't know, that's a stupid question. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. They're, yeah, they're curved around, obviously, in the cylinder, and they're straight up and straight down, okay? And what about an Erlenmeyer flask? Yeah, they're, they're angled in like a conical way, right? So does that make... So here we go. We're going to see the only reason... So there's two reasons, but one of the only reasons why Erlenmeyer flasks exist. Go ahead, Lynn. It's because if I swirl this, is anything coming out? No. Uh, and if I if I swirl this, <laughs> is anything coming out? No, I didn't see it. Uh, yeah, okay. Whatever. I think you need okay, so does that it. does that make sense? There's a very specific reason for having an Erlenmeyer flask. That's gonna look terrible on video. I don't think it was a Um I think it was, but that's this is a flipping hazard, but that's uh, okay. So at some point in time, what's going to happen is we've got. I'm going to add. I'm going to add some of my titrant. I should be using a funnel for this too, but I'm not going to. It's closed. It's not going to come out from the bottom. What? I should be using a funnel, right? Yep, no. but I'm not. <laughs> okay. Like what? What does a funnel do? Um, it's, it just just allows it collects a larger area and and funnels it into a smaller area. But if you don't need a funnel, there's no use using a funnel. That's like you, absolutely you're going to use one when you do your titration. That's totally fine. Okay. So in here, I've got an acid. And in here, I've got a base, okay? So if I, take a very, if I take a very precise volume of my base, do you remember what this is called? We already talked about it. 
This is a pipette. What is the purpose of a pipette? Yeah, to get a very precise, maybe not exact, right? It's not exactly 10 milliliters, but it's about as precise as we could possibly get it to be. So what's going to happen is I'm going to take my pipette and I'm going to pull up 10 milliliters of my sample. Okay, so I'm going to do this the same way I normally would any other day. Boom, okay, 10 milliliters, awesome. How fast did that take? How long did that take, sorry? 30 seconds. That's how, that's how long it should take to, to, uh, um, to pipette a sample out, but that's fine. It takes you more, right? You're not as well practiced as other people are, and that's totally fine. Okay, perfect, I'm not gonna blow out the excess in the tip, I'm just gonna let it there. Perfect, so I pulled out exactly exactly 10 milliliters of a base. So in here, I've got a base. And you know how I know it's a base? Um, Bromothymol blue stays blue in basic solutions. Can I get you to double check for me? When will this solution be neutral? What color will this solution turn at a pH of 7? What color will this be in a pH of 7? It'll be green, right? Yeah. It'll be equal parts blue and yellow, so it'll be green. Perfect. Yeah, so so we're doing a solution. We're, 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 we're taking one solution, we're adding it to another, okay? Okay, that's my hydrochloric acid, good. So what's gonna happen, and I don't know, I don't know how well you can see this, so I'll try and I'll try and prop it up. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I'm going to try and prop it up as best I can. There we go. So I've got what can be considered to be a blue solution. And because there are graduations on here, I know what volume of solution is in here to start with. What's going to happen to this level of water as I open the stock column? Down. The volume of water is going to drop, right? So the readings are going to change. And so as, as I add my acid to here, I can slowly add it or quickly add it, whatever. Okay? And so what happened, what happened as, as I added acid? What happened to the color of my solution? Yeah, it went... It, it went from blue to yellow. Now remember, the color changed. Did you see a green in there? Yeah. You probably did, but it happened so quickly. Why did it happen so quickly? Yeah, well, I was, I was adding my acid too quickly. That's, what, that's, that's the problem with that. I was adding my acid too quickly. That we, it's what we call we overshot our end point. So I'm going to describe some terms, and I just want you to listen up, and hopefully we can kind of understand what these terms mean. So, how many moles of B of the base five. would I need to neutralize the five, five moles of the acid? Five. Okay. If, if I were to add exactly the same, or if the molar ratio was different, right? What if this was a, a two? How much of B would I need? Double. I would mean double, so I'd need 10, right? 10 moles, whatever. This is called the equivalence point. It's the hypothetical point at which you have the exact correct amount to totally react with that thing. Okay? Pardon? Yeah, what if I what if I added 10.0000000001 moles. 
Is that is that exact equivalence to that? No, it's not. So what what I need you to understand, what I no 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 calm down, calm down. What I need you to understand is that the equivalence point is a is a totally hypothetical amount. It's a per, totally hypothetical. Is it is it possible to stop at exactly this many molecules and exactly that many molecules? No. No, it is not possible. And that is not the expectation. Okay? What I'm trying to get, what I'm trying to lead you to understand is that this is this is what we call the equivalence point. It's a theoretical point that at at some point in time we did reach equivalence. Would you agree? At some point in time, there was equal amounts, but it's totally impossible to stop at equivalence, and that's perfectly fine. What we do is we use a visual way of telling us when we're really close to it. A visual way of telling us when we're really, really, really close to the equivalence point. And we call that the end point of the reaction. So I need you to understand, the equivalence point is totally hypothetical, and you cannot actually achieve it in the lab and stop at it, okay? So this is hypothetical. The, here's the problem. Do you remember how many molecules are in one mole of something? Six, it's 6.02 times 10 to the 23. Remember, re <laughs> realistically speaking, if you're off by one molecule, you're off the equivalence point, right? Like, real, like from a technical perspective, so it's not possible, okay? To identify this point in the lab, we need to observe a change in property of the solution. Now, we can observe lots of properties. We can see when it starts to conduct, conduct uh, electricity, or maybe when it stops conducting electricity. Maybe we can stop at a very specific pH, or maybe we want to stop at a very specific color. Okay, But can you see how color is a, a, like a little bit subjective? Right? Okay. This change in the property, when it went from blue to green, we were supposed to stop at green, right? That was our end point. The end point is what you observe in the lab. The equivalence point is the hypothetical point that you're trying to stop at. But it's not possible. So just don't worry about it. Yeah, what? Yes. Absolutely, there is one of those. Yeah, it's called a, a pH probe. A probe is just something that's sensing something all the time. And so you can buy a pH probe, and all you have to do, right? All you would have to do is, I'm going to add this to the, and I'm going to, I'm going to fake it like I add, I'm adding more base in a perfectly, like, quantifiable amount when I'm not. So what you would do is you would stick your pH probe in here, right? You would stick your pH probe in here, and then instead of going really, really, really fast, Wim, you would just go... You would drip go drip by drip. Drip by drip. No. <laughs> and you would and you would shake it, right? You're trying to mix up your sample and you would shake it. And if you know the rate, if you know the rate that this solution, I don't know if you can see the drops adding, but if you know the rate that it's adding at, then you can stick a pH probe in there and you can constantly measure the pH. And so what's the pH doing? Is the pH constantly getting higher and higher and higher or lower and lower and lower? Lower. We're adding an acid, right? So it's getting lower and lower and lower. And at some point in time, we want to stop when it gets to be green, right? That's the whole purpose. Now, there's a lot, there's a lot of nuance in titrations. There's a lot of like tiny tips and tricks that I'm going to try and tell you over the next couple days. But first, the first thing we want to do is we want to get really well acquainted to what a titration is. So if you just flip over the page. Okay. 
Uh, I want to say a couple things. This is like this is like a, a hypothetical. This is what would happen in the lab, but I, I want to give you some tips and tricks about what you actually need to do in the lab. Okay. Now let's think about this. I've got my burette, right? So a burette is used to precisely determine the volume of titrant added, right? You want to know if this is where I started and this is where I stopped. I just need to take the difference in those values and that'll give me the volume that was added to, this, to the sample. Would you agree with that? Okay, all right, good. Now, when I first filled up my burette, I just grabbed this burette from a, there's a pile of burettes in a couple containers out in the lab. Do I know what the, the, the person who last used this burette, do I know what they put inside the burette? No. Could have been an acid, could have been a base, could have been a, a redox thing, could have been just a neutral compound. So what, if there was any residue left over, let's say they put a base in here and I'm pouring an acid, what's going to happen if there's a tiny little bit of residue left over? Yeah. They're going to get a reaction. So I think, let's say I think that I'm putting 0.1 mole per liter concentration acid in here. But when it reacts with the base, what happens with the concentration of my acid? It'll, it'll be reduced, right? So I think I'm putting a certain concentration in here, but I'm not. So what I want you to start thinking about is that we should rinse our burette. with like five milliliters or 10 milliliters, it's just, just with a small amount of titrant. So what I should have done is I should have added a little bit, just a tiny little bit of titrant, and then I could have, I could have uh, rinsed the sides of it. I could have reacted all of that extra base that was in there from the last time, and then all I gotta do is I just have to dump it, I just have to dump it out into a waste beaker. And now I can properly, now I can properly fill up my burette. Is, does that make sense? Is that okay? It's the same thing with our pipette. Our pipette, do you know the last thing that somebody used in this pipette? No, so realistically what I should have done, right, at the beginning of my experiment, is I should have, Cold up, cold up a little bit of sample, okay? And I should have coated the walls with it. And then what you can do is you can just dump it out into a waste beaker. Does that make sense? Like that's what we should be doing, okay? And that's kind of the expectation that I'm that I'm that I'm giving you from now on. Okay, um, the difference between the initial and final volume, that will determine the amount of titrant that you added. So you just got to do a little bit of math. The sample is usually in an Erlenmeyer flask. Why is it in an Erlenmeyer flask? So it doesn't spill. So it doesn't spill out. Also, as you're adding it, as you're adding the titrant, it's going to splash up. And the, the conical, um, the sides of the flask that you're using helps prevent that splash up from leaving, but if you had a beaker, it might be able to, to leave. So just, it's good to have an Erlenmeyer flask. Okay, when the change in property, or you know, the color change typically, when it has been observed, that's when you know you reached your endpoint. Now, the endpoint symbolizes that you're close to equivalence, right? That's the whole point of it. The endpoint is what you see in the lab. The equivalence point is hypothetically we're getting close. Um, and we can stop the reaction. Good, perfect. So this is just a picture of a, of a typical style. I didn't want to draw a picture because you know how that would go. So let's, let's do some math. The whole point, what's the whole purpose of a titration? We want to, we want to figure out either... What's the concentration of this, or what's the concentration of this? That's the whole point, okay? So let's think about uh, uh, an example. Typically, several trials are needed to make sure there's agreement between this information. So what I'll do, I'll do one titration, 
if I get a good color change or a good endpoint, I'll, I'll make sure that I use that information in my, in my analysis. And then I'll dump it out, right? You take it, you go to a waste speaker, you dump it out, you rinse out your container, your Erlenmeyer flask, right? And then you start all over again. You do another titration. We want three trials. Um, where is it? We want three trials. I need you to write this down. So we need three trials to agree plus or minus 0 0.2 milliliters. What that means is your, your highest value and your lowest value have to be between 0 0.2. They can't be further than 0 0.2 of each other. So let's just take a look at a very, this is a very standard titration. So a 1.59 gram mass of sodium carbonate was dissolved to make a 100 milliliter solution. So we make, we're going to make a stock solution. Do you remember ever making a standard solution in those kind of round bottom volumetric flasks? That's a very standard thing to do. Several 10 milliliter samples, right? We're going to pipe out 10 milliliter samples. Of the standard solution were then taken and titrated with a solution which was prepared by diluting an original hydrogen chloride by a factor of 10. Methyl orange indicator was used. Perfect, no problem. Let's take a look at this. Here's a very typical observation chart for a titration. When I titrated the first time, what color did I see? Red. When I titrated it the next three times, what colors did I see? Orange. Immediately, you should be very suspicious of one of these, right? Do you remember, remember how we went from blue all the way to yellow, but we were supposed to stop at green, right? So you probably, we overshot that first titration. Let's think about this. Let's take our final burette reading, and let's subtract our initial burette reading, and let's see how many milliliters of hydrogen chloride did we add, okay? So what is this? 13.3 minus 0 0.2. 13.1 milliliters, perfect. <laughs> Do the next three for me. You're taking the final and subtracting the initial. So did you get, in trial number two, we added 12.7 milliliters. Yeah. In trial number three and four, we both added 12.8 milliliters. So do you have three values that are within that 0 0.2 milliliter range? The highest and the lowest agree within 0 0.2 of each other? Yeah. Yep, okay, perfect. One of these trials we need to totally ignore when we're doing our analysis. Which one? The first one, totally ignore it. We still wrote it down, we still observed it, but now that we're doing our analysis, that we're just ignoring it now. So what I want you to ask, or what I want to ask you is what is the average volume? Do you know how to calculate averages? Add all of them and divide by three. Add all of them, divide by how many there are, right? And there's three this time. So add them all up and divide by that. You're gonna get 12.77. Or you're going to get 12.7666666666666. Right? Okay, 12.7666, blah, 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 blah. But just keep that, just keep that value in the back of your mind. Now, what I want to ask you 
is that we had one reaction and then we had another reaction and we want to figure out we want to figure out what is um, we want to figure out what is uh, what is the concentration of um, hydrogen chloride that we that we got let me just see um, I just want to make sure that we're on the right track good okay so what's this reaction? What is the reaction that we have going on? Do you know what's in my titrant? Do you know what's in my burette? Read the question. One of them is always a titrant, and one of them is always a sample. Do you know which substance was in my burette? I'll give you a little hint. It says titration of, it always says of the sample with the titrant. So which substance did we have in our burette? The titrant is always referring to what you're adding, the amount that you're changing in your burette. So we've got hydrochloric acid up in the burette, and what substance do we have in the Erlenmeyer flask? We've got our sodium carbonate. Now I want to be very clear, when you're doing titration, typically, Typically, you want to know the volume of both of these things, and you want to know the concentration of one of these things. You're trying to find the second concentration. That's usually what's happening. So let's think about this for a second. What is the reaction between hydrogen chloride and sodium carbonate? It's going to be a double replacement, right? So let's go hydrochloric acid and it's going to react with sodium carbonate. So what are we going to get? What's going to kick out what here? The plus the Yep, what's the what's the plus thing on this side? The hydrogen, what's the plus thing on this side? The sodium. So we're going to get H2CO3, which is carbonic acid. And then we're going to get what else? NaCl. And we just have to, we have to balance this chemical reaction. So I need two of these. Good. Okay, the two things that we're adding to each other. Typically, we want to know both volumes. Do you know how much hydrochloric acid was added from the burette? Do you know how much hydrochloric acid was added from the burette? Um, you should know, you just calculated it. Okay, yeah. So that's the, remember, this is the average volume of hydrogen chloride that was added. So let's, underneath that, let's write that. 12.76, blah, 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 millimeter, milliliters. Do you know how much sodium carbonate was added? Do you know the volume of sodium carbonate? It's not the average, because the average came from the burette, and you know you had hydrogen chloride in the burette. 10 milliliters. 10 milliliters, right? Mm -hmm. It tells you in the question. It says, nope. Okay, and here's the problem. We made a solution of 100 milliliters, but what did we take out of it? Several 10 milliliter samples were extracted from it. And I'm trying... 
Like, I know this is a complicated problem, but you will get used to this, okay? Just sit back and relax, it'll be okay. Okay, we know we had 12.7-ish milliliters of hydrochloric acid, and we know we had 10-ish milliliters of sodium carbonate. Now, let's think about this. Do you know the concentrations of either of these? No, okay? I'll tell you right now, we're trying to find the concentration of hydrochloric acid. They give you they give you enough information to find the concentration of sodium carbonate, okay? So just as, as an aside, okay? As, as a total aside, let's try and calculate the concentration in moles per liter of sodium carbonate. Typically, it'll be given to you, typically it'll be given to you, but let's just do this as an aside. So read the question. We want moles per liter of sodium carbonate. Do you know how much sodium carbonate we originally started with? 1.59 grams. And we dissolved it in 100 milliliters. We can get a concentration from that, right? How, how, do, you get, how do you get moles out of this? You need the molar mass of sodium carbonate, right? So go ahead and do that. Do that right now. It's okay, just get the molar mass of sodium carbonate. trying to do this in my head and I think I'm coming up with something close to 106. Thank you. 105.99? Yeah. Okay. Our molar mass of sodium carbonate is 105.99 grams of uh, grams per mole. Okay, if I want moles per liter, how am I going to get moles per liter out of this? Molar ratio. So. No. Okay, let's. No, 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 no. I just, I just want you to be. I want you. I want to be very, very clear. We're not going to use a molar ratio. Um, like not yet. Okay. We're just, we're just trying to find the initial concentration before any reaction happened. So there hasn't been a reaction yet, we're just trying to find our initial concentration. I understand we're going to use the molar ratio eventually, but all I'm asking, when I dissolve this much in that much water, could you get a concentration from that? Yes, 100%, okay? So we want moles per liter, we've got yeah, I just realized, Wim. Thank you. What do we got to do? Flip it. And Sorry, everybody. Sorry. Okay, now we can, yeah, sure, whatever, that's fine. Now we can, now we can uh, cancel out our mass. How much sodium carbonate did we start off with? 1.59 grams of sodium carbonate. And then how many liters of water did we dissolve this into? 100, so that's 0 0.100 liters of water, right? Just stick with me, please. Stick with me. Don't mentally give up. Don't mentally give up. 
So just do this calculation for me, really quickly. Boom, 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 boom. Handy calculator, right? Perfect. Awesome. Um, uh, well, we're not going to finish the whole booklet, and that's fine. But we need to finish this one example. No. Okay, what was our original concentration of sodium carbonate? Shahad, what'd you get? I got 0 0.1. Zero, 0 point what? 1500. 0 0.1, so 0 0.1500 moles per liter of sodium carbonate, right? Okay, 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 we are so close. No, just chill out. Let's calm down. We are so insanely close. What is the concentration that I started with of sodium carbonate? 100. 0 0.1500 or whatever moles per liter. Okay. Let's think about this. I had a sample, right? What's the concentration of sodium carbonate in my sample? What's the concentration of sodium carbonate in my sample? And how much volume is in there? 10 milliliters. Not the 100 that we started with. We made a big batch of it so that we could what? Take out tiny little samples individually at a time, right? Because we want to do this multiple times. So. We're going to take out this much of that. We know we use that much of that. Is it physically possible for us to get a concentration using this information? Can I get moles of hydrogen chloride? I've got, can I, okay, can I get moles of sodium carbonate from these two things? Yes. And then I can turn the moles of sodium carbonate into moles of hydrogen chloride. And then I can get moles of hydrogen chloride, and I can divide it by the volume to get molar concentration. Right? That's all we're going to do. So this was the whole purpose. Maybe let's write this down. The whole purpose of this was to find the initial concentration of Na2CO3. That's the whole point of that. We did that. Good. Awesome. Put it aside. So now what we want to do is now we want to find the concentration measured in moles per liter of hydrochloric acid. This is going to be so so phenomenally easy because you're so good at stoichiometry. We've been doing this for two and a half weeks now. What are you looking for? Yeah, what are you, what are, what, like, what's, what's the whole method that we've been using for a semester now? It's, no, it's called unit analysis, right? <laughs> It's called unit analysis. Yeah the, yeah, the method that we've been using to do our math has been called unit analysis. So, so what, are we, what units are we looking for? Moles per liter of? So what do you want on top? Where can I find moles of? Where can I find moles of HCl? I could use the molar mass, but am I given a mass? No, so that doesn't give me moles. Where can I get moles from? The molar ratio. What's the molar ratio? Two moles of HCl over. Boom, done. Two moles of HCl over one mole of sodium carbonate. Do you, yes or no, do you want moles of hydrogen chloride on top? Yes, good, awesome. What do we want to get rid of? How can I possibly do that? You need the concentration that we literally just figured out, right? So 
So was it important to get that concentration? Yes. yes. So 0 0.1500 or 0, whatever, moles of sodium carbonate over one liter of sodium carbonate. Okay, have I successfully canceled out moles of sodium carbonate? Yes. Yes. What do I need to cancel out now? Liter. Liter. Liters of? Do you have anything, anything at all to do with liters of sodium carbonate? You have milliliters. Oh, or we just leave it. 10 milliliters of sodium carbonate. So would you agree, would you agree the liters and liters cancel out, but what's left? Milli, right? But how can I cancel out that milli? <laughs> yeah. What do you want on the bottom? Liters of what substance? Yeah, you have milliliters of HCl, right? How many milliliters of HCl did you add from your burette? 12.76, blah, 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 milliliters of HCl. So does milli, milli cancel out? Yes, perfect. So moles, moles, tell me what units, don't give me a number yet, what units are you left with? What's the only unit on top? Moles of HCl, what's the only unit on the bottom? Liters of HCl. Is that exactly what you wanted from the beginning? Yes. Um, this answer might be wrong. If it is, calm down. It's okay. That answer might be wrong. It's okay. Is it right or wrong? Just like a two, three, five? Yeah. No. Zero point two three five moles per liter. Okay. Just as a recap. When you're doing a titration, let's go, let's just go back to the previous page. As long as you have the volume of this and the concentration of one of these, if you have both volumes, and one concentration, you can find the concentration of another thing. That's all you need. Both volumes and one of the concentrations, then you can find the concentration of one of the other things. That's the whole point of a titration. Now, today, today was a little bit of a crapshoot, and that's totally fine. Okay? That's totally, perfectly acceptable. There is tons of time left. There is tons of time left. We'll talk about a primary standard tomorrow. We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna make a primary standard in the lab tomorrow. Okay. Um, yeah. I would like you to just try this for me, please. Try this question. There's seven minutes left in class. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. 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 No, this one. Okay, I, I need to be very clear. There's no difference. But this I like better. Because, because the problem with here is that some people, when they write moles, per liter, they love to go divided by liters or something. And this, I don't know what the hell this is, right? I don't know what's going on. But if you go moles per liter, you know exactly how to cancel out liters, right? Times by liters, right? So this, 
ne I never, I never like people writing minutes like this. That it confuses people. They don't know what's going on. Did you know? Did you know that this was a fraction? Did you know that? That's a fraction. Yeah, that's that's always you wear a book. Yeah, and it's the same thing with grams per mole. It's really grams per mole. Right? So how do I cancel out moles? Times by moles on top, right? Okay, I would like this question done for tomorrow. I don't see any. I don't see any reason at all why you can't walk into this room and I can't check your paper after walking into this room. And you should be able to tell me what the concentration of that substance is. It's a big substance, right? What do you mean? We just add up the number of calcium, the number of carbon, the number of water. I will be there for that one. And if you run a tap on the that okay? No. <laughs> this is not my idea. <laughs> Don't frame my idea. You were uh, in a That's totally fine. It might because it's you're just gonna either stay confused or be confused, and that's okay. To make a primary standard, we have to dissolve a precise mass of solute in a precise volume of water. All you're doing right now is you're taking some sort of a solid, you're taking some sort of a solid, and you're gonna dissolve it in one of those volumetric flasks. So put this into here and then fill it up to hundred milliliters. So you know the mass. 3.07 grams. Do you know the molar mass? No. No, but you can find it out. You just add up all the potassiums and all the carbons and all the hydrogens and all the oxygens. It's not that. It's not that hard. How many potassiums? One. How many carbons? Eight. How many? How many hydrogens? Five. How many oxygens? Three. Four. Four. Just add, just add them all up. Just find the molar mass. All you're trying to do is you're trying to find the concentration in moles per liter of, this is, I want to be very clear, this is called potassium hydrogen phthalate, and this is a short, this is a shorthand version of this thing. They're the same thing. There's no reaction. We're dissolving something in water. That's it. KHP is potassium hydrogen phthalate. And we're dissolving potassium hydrogen phthalate in water. So get the concentration in moles per liter. That's all. That's all I want you to do. That's it. The only thing you got to do for tomorrow. You have the mass. You want moles. What do you need? Molar mass. And you have volume. You solve for moles per